Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us to this uh, another ac huge Academy talk. Uh, this time with uh, our first international guest, uh, who is going to be talking about typography. Um, then uh, we are going to have uh, his presentation and we are going to have the Q&A section just at the end of the talk. Uh, you will be able to unmute yourself and ask Thomas anything you want, or you could leave uh, your questions in the chat box and we will take care of, of them later. Uh, so Thomas Jokin, our guest, is the founder of Type Thursdays, which is a huge type community around the world. Uh, he is also partnered at Lexen, uh, adjunct lecturer in, uh, at City University of New York, uh, Queens College. And last but not least, uh, he's a great type designer and his fonts are available on Google Fonts, Adobe Fonts and other distributors for you uh, to use. Uh, we are so glad to have him here today, not only because he's a great professional, but also because he's a great mentor. I've learned so much from him and I hope you guys uh, could learn a lot as well today. Uh, please welcome Thomas Jokin. Alex, thank you for the introduction. Obviously, first of all, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, you know, obviously everyone's busy doing things. So I really appreciate you taking the time to join this conversation. And also, I mean, obviously I'm really honored to be asked to talk. Uh, Alex is a great chapter lead in Bogota where it tends to around the world. And I was really inspired by, uh, by Alex's action and leadership in Bogota for a great an event. They had, the, they had a great live event and then coronavirus hit and everything had to change the digital in the response. But I was very inspired by the passion, love and kind of desire for typographic community and knowledge uh, from what I saw in the outcome of Type Thursday Bogota's first event. So, and also just being invited here in the Academy, I think it's an a great initiative. I think internal organizations having uh, internal documents or internal information to share with themselves, I think is a really powerful tool for improving the culture of a community, of an organization. And uh, if I can ask, if there was one outcome I would hope for for the end of this conversation is to realize the kind of power typography has in the world and that Every time that you're setting type, you're actually making decisions that has an impact on other people in the world and the outcomes you want. So that's my hope that that's the outcome you realize that it, that's the real potential here and you have the capacity to have, an impact, to have an impact on that. Along the way, we're gonna learn a lot of other things about variable fonts, how they fit into the equation, the specific attributes, how they were used to be effective and also a journey of process in general. So let me get started with the walkthrough. So I'm Thomas Jockin, as the intro Alex gave talks about. Uh, in this context of this lecture, I'm going to talk about as a partner at Lexan. It's an educational tech partnership organization that's focused on using typographic interventions to improve re educational outcomes. Uh, this was founded by my part by the founder, uh, Dr. Bonnie Shaver Troop, in 2000. So let's, I'm going to start with a very proactive statement. There is a reading crisis. And we know this because the stats show that in the United States alone, let alone other places around the world, 64% of U.S. students are reported to have some reading difficulty, according to the U.S. Department of Education. This is from 2008, but this stat has been very steady for the last 20, actually, excuse me, 60 years, a very long time prior to screen interventions or anything like that. Now, that percentage within it has a well-known group called dyslexics. They're a, no, they're a very well-known population to have reading difficulty, but they're not nearly the totality of people who have difficulty reading. In fact, uh, more, than a major, more than a half of students do not read at proficiency, and this has some serious consequences. Uh, for example, usually, how you learn to read, your reading capacity stays with you the rest of your life. So whatever your state you started at, you have in, in school reading, you'll be that the rest of your life. And that has serious implications on civic engagement, uh, medicine, healthcare, for example. Like for example, there's millions of people who have uh, errors of reading prescriptions in medicine, for example, as a very, sim very simple example, let alone being able to read legal documents, let alone political campaigns or literature, for example, or voting. These are cases where reading 
uh, and the lack of ability to read actually has direct consequences on people's lives, let alone lots of the stats that can, I, that can be listed up about economic outcomes that are tied to an inability to read, dropout rates, rates of uh, going to prison. There's very high representation of an ability to read within prison populations, that, and these are all stacked to be skewed towards uh, demographic race and the cities that are, well, not advantaged, I'll say it that way. So this has a lot of social dynamics attached to it in this stat. And this should not be surprising that we have this difficulty in reading, because as opposed to other learned thing, like other things like speech, for example, you don't have to be taught how to speak. That happens naturally in human beings. Reading instead is a learned skill. It, it has to be acquired. And it's a complex activity in co using decoding phonetics and background knowledge. It's multifaceted with a lot of moving parts involved with it that have to work together. A good analogy I can give you is like riding a bike. You know, when you first rode a bike, it's incredibly, uh, it's actually kind of intense and kind of awkward. It requires a lot of intentional focus to be able to ride a bike. But then over time, I'm gaining experience in, well, what the word we use is fluency. It becomes natural and normal. You don't have to think about it. You can just focus on going from A to B with riding the bike. You don't have to strain yourself in the thinking process of moving the pedals, balancing yourself, shifting the movement from left to right, for example. And current interventions to change this outcome, basically, how can we help students be more fluid in reading? Uh, everything's been thought of, teacher interventions, learning and phonetics, there's been many attempts in education to try to solve this problem in 60 years and with not much success. I mean, here's just one example I can list of many. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation had a multi-year intensive program to improve teacher performance, one of the metrics was reading, and to show no outcome over multiple years at a cost of almost, of over a half a billion dollars. So incredible amounts of capital, attention, goodwill, and energy has been put into this endeavor to help improve reading outcomes in students, but with nothing, no, no improvements. Except there's been one intervention that no one took seriously. It's completely just blown by and not considered. Typography. It's the thing most directly in front of you that no one took for, took, no one took for granted. It's kind of a theme in typography. A lot of people who aren't trained in typography just get used to it. It's just air. Not realizing it's a very intentional thing and it can be controlled and directed at. And my partner, uh, Dr. Bonnie Shiva the founder of Lexan, uh, has invented basically what's called the Shaver Tube formulation, which instantaneously improves reading fluency in students. And she's and since 2000, Dr. Bonnie Shaver Troop has used this formulation to instantaneously improve reading fluency in students. Uh, the effectiveness of Lexan has been collected as data since 2000, with the first school study in 2013. We conducted a, in 2018 a study on third grade students showing an average improvement in reading fluency of 19.8% over time to enrollment. These are very, and with the very common outcomes in the previous studies as well. The fonts that Bonnie used prior to my involvement in, in, in the approximately around 2000 were static fonts. They were just generic static fonts that she would manipulate in Word with, and with her intervention method. And, my involvement in 2008, I joined her to implement a variable font that would apply the Shaver Tube formulations and production notes from her in the field experience as an educational therapist working with children on open source font, QuickSend, which I worked on as part of that project within Google a couple of years prior. What you're seeing right here is a note, is basically notes between me and Bonnie on improving basically the font direction we need to be taken on this uh, variable font. The Shaver Tube formulation applies amplified spacing between and inside letter forms to synchronize to the individual reader's needs. So instead of one font with one setting that everybody gets, it's a one size fit all kind of affair. Instead, we find the right spacing for the particular child to their need. Some people need a little bit of improvement. Some people need a really intense amplification. It's basically like eyeglasses. Are we not surprised that some people are, have, are more nearsighted than others, for example? And if you ask that same person, the different people, excuse me, to look at a board 
And some people could read it perfectly fine from the board, but other people can't, it's blurry to them. We wouldn't give them all the same prescription eyeglasses or give them no prescription at all and think what's wrong with you? Why can't you see the board? It's the same kind of mindset here by typography. Up till now, we've been delivering type as a one size fit all affair. Instead, Lexin, what it does is it gives you an individuated choice of spacing to your particular need as a individual. And of particular usage is using variable font technology to instead of a normal font, which kind of is jerky, it kind of jumps. Like think about going from weights, right? A regular to a bold, you couldn't get anything in between. That's called a discrete jump. You have these discrete jumps between the options. Instead in Lexan, it's called, it's continuous. You can get anything between. And that allows for a granular level of control and, and delivery of individual need that would not be possible otherwise in a discrete font. So this is one of the cases where the variable font property of continuous selection is absolutely essential to give you the perfect selection for a child or student or reader to their particular need. And you're seeing a visualization from our website to show this. And what's really powerful is it's basically in terms of how it works in code, it's just a, it's just one CSS tag. In this case, it's a specific uh, tag called Lexan in, in full capitals like this. And you can see on the, on the slider what's happening. That slider is representing in a visual user, user interface how that's changing, but it also you can change it from data and code. So that means basically from a data input, that CSS attribute can also be changed as well. So that's what gives it a lot of its power. Continuous selection and responsiveness from a data input. And we also, we at Lexan see a, that this personalized typography grounded in data is beneficial for other script systems such as Arabic. We've expanded Lexan to, to support Arabic in 2019. With the support of Google, Lexan is available on Google Fonts and as a result, G Suite, which includes Google Docs and Slides. This is important, not just to typography and the general public, but also to educators around the world who use G Suite for delivering content to their students. And because Lexan is an open source font, third-party apps and extensions such as Canva, TextHelp, and, and Helperbird have included Lexan in their font libraries, which adds even more accessibility to this font than previously possible. We see Lexan as the future of design. Lexan embraces the edges rather than the middle, thus creates accessibility for all. Lexan leads the new science and art to address the needs of the actual individual rather than the fictional average. So what I mean is in my example before, instead of thinking of this abstracted average person, like every it is a one size fit all, there's just this perfect one human being that everybody just kind of, we could basically be okay and we can just rely on that for our design decisions. And that, except that that's a fiction, that's not how reality works. And each individual needs an individual need. And by serving those edges, we actually serve everybody. So that's why it's accessibility. To give you another, another metaphor for that, think about the, the kind of ramp curves on sidewalks. Those are meant for people with, with wheelchairs, for example, but that benefits everybody that those side step, those sidewalks have that ramp on. So we see a very similar metaphor here for typography and Lexan being part of that new science and art. Thank you. I'd love to have any questions you have or answer any, any other clarifications you like and or anything about variable fonts or this methodology. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I think it's, a, it's one of the projects that I really admire the most because it's uh, actually the first pro project that I see that it, it use a variable font technology, not only for being like pretty or experimental thing, but also because um, uh, a really good purpose. So I don't know guys, if you have any, any questions for Thomas, Right now, um, I, I, I have I, I have some questions because if 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 you think about the use case, so th this is a font that allows you to make these modifications, so you are able to learn faster and understand better the con the content. Yes, that's correct. The literature points out that reading fluency is a predictor of reading comprehension. So that's the end goal. The end goal is reading comprehension and you need fluency to achieve that. 
And and how are you measuring that fluency compared with the Times New Roman versus Lexan that, that you have that graph yeah, at the beginning? That, there are two ways to measure. The way there are two methods. One method is called a, a fluency test, which is done from educational therapists. They basically have a subject read text set in different fonts with different texts so that there's no skewing based on uh, repeating the same repeating the same Content. language over and over again. And the text is is two is on usually two grade, grade levels above what is the student's grade level. That way, basically, what they're testing is the actual capacity of the font to improve or or not improve reading performance. Uh, so that's one method. The other method is eye tracking methods. So you can measure basically saccades and regressions. So that's basically the eye basically reading across the page and measuring against the regressions where an error happens, for example. Uh, that's basically what happens is that there's two methods. They basically reduce the same result or measure the same thing, which is basically seeing how many words are read over a certain duration of time minus errors. So that's where the measurement of words correct per minute comes in. My partner, Lex, uh, Bonnie is the main researcher, so she can answer this question much more robustly, but I'm just paraphrasing what's on the website. <laughs> okay, no, I just, I just want to understand that because if I think in the use case and I'm me, right? I, I get to the side, there is this font on the side and I want to modify that based on my uh, capacity to my, my fluency reading. It, my hypothesis or what I think might happen is that I will not be really able to detect what is the right combination for me because I have to experience several times in order to identify what's the right combination for me to really be able to read with more fluidity. So I, I don't know if there is something in the middle that brings the value to the user. So when you said this uh, eye tracking technology, so if I have something that presents me the same text or a book or, or, or some content with different options and identify the, the one that works best for me and then show the rest of the content based on that, I see the, the, the improvement. But if not, I think it's difficult for me as an individual to start testing different options until I get yeah. the right one. So I don't know what, what is the thought behind that? Well, actually, actually building your point even further, it's not the, even the actual individual, there's their actual fluent, their, their actual optimal setting changes over themselves. Think about this. Think about you're going to get older. Your vision is going to get weaker. Think about str eye strain from looking at the computer for too long for multiple hours, lighting conditions, movement. Or if you're basically looking at your phone, say you're in a commuter train, you're tra and things moving, for example. These are all things affecting your fluency, basically all those things. So we can go even deeper and say, uh, even the actual individual, their needs changes within the day. Not even, it doesn't just stay the same. So like, we go even further with that. Now, the short answer is, one is there is a difference between the, co the context we're talking about, the use case. So for example, if it, from an educator's point of view, we're dealing with the question of, we have a, sub, a student, who's struggling to read and we need to do intervention to help them read. Because the big thing too is that, you know, I like, to, I like to use the metaphor of fragile reading versus robust readers. If you're a train, it's like riding a bike. I'll use that metaphor again. If you're a competent bike rider, you can handle so uneven terrain, wet ground, you can deal with stressors, things that are hindering your reading, your biking experience, uh, but you're still capable to handle it. You may be strained, but you can handle it and you can still achieve your outcome, right? Uh, a fragile reader, or in this case, a person who doesn't know how to ride a bike or ride a well, they won't be able to. They're going to literally crash, <laughs> basically. They're going to fall down. So I think of it also, there's also, there's that use case example. So the idea is that interventions of reading, this is meant to get a child or a, stu or a reader to go from a fragile reader to a robust reader so they can handle a less than ideal typographic setting. So that's that'd be a, the one use case from an educational intervention point of view. Now, in general applications, like I know a lot of us here are UX, user interface environments, where the context is maybe much more varied than the controlled context of education. Uh, yeah, those will require different technological environments. Now, it is true, the research has shown 
I recall from talking to you know, my mainstream, the Rean researcher, Dr. Von Shaver Troop, uh, that self selection is a, a relatively reliable measure of effectiveness. It's not the best, but it works. It's a shorthand that can work. So basically, it's the same argument why you guys give dark, dark root. Why do you give? Why do you give dark? Uh, what's the word? Dark mode. Thank you. Sorry, my mind just got lost. The reason why you offer dark mode is because you trust that people can self-select and make a preference of what they want. So you could argue on that same model is that if you give these, if it's a low cost to offer because of the strain of code is relatively minor, why couldn't you add it? Just like adding a dark mode. And if anything, a dark mode actually requires more complexity to deal with because you have to deal with contrast change and all the other, and, and other hierarchy problems that come up with reversing the colors, for example. That'd be another way to, get, to build off that point. Thank you. You're welcome. So great question. It's an excellent question. I have another question for you. Um, Please. What were you using like to test this? This was just tested on screens like regular computer tablet, or do you know if there are any e-readers that apply this technology or something like that? Yeah, great question. Um, in terms of the tests done by Bonnie, they were I mostly paper. Again, I, I'm speaking for her, so it's not that I can only say answer so much. Uh, however, the research does show that it, the difference between screen and paper is relatively minor. There might be some, uh, there might be some effects of eye straining because of the reflective light effects, which leads to those issues of eye strain. Uh, but the act, in terms of any, the, the specific intervention at the moment of investigation, just reading over a couple minutes, there's, there's no scientific showing of straining between or difference between paper and screen, but probably over you know, five hours, 10, eight hours, something like that, then yes, that probably would be a significant factor or a contributing factor. Thanks. Another question, Sandra? I have a, a minor one, or at least I think it is so. How were you able to decide I'm, go, I'm going to call that the edge cases. So how much uh, the type could shrink and, and yes. when was it enough, like too much? Excellent, excellent question. All right, so the short answer is the, inter the, the edges of where they went were based on Bonnie's 20 years of experience as an educational therapist. So she's worked with mm -hmm. children as young as three to adults. So she's worked with that wide range and these, this was the ranges that she worked in now. Uh, these are empirical basis. So they're basically from the bottom of empirical from Pani's experience. Now, are they the theoretical absolute edges? We don't know. And that's kind of an actually interesting challenge or interesting question. That's something I'm personally am interested in. Uh, there definitely probably is an edge. There absolutely is an edge. There will come a point, there definitely theoretically will be an edge in both directions. There will come a point where the spacing gets so tight, we obliterate any ability to perceive. Uh, them as, in, as the individual letters and thus build off our understanding to build phonetics and then their understanding. Um, on the other way, the letters can, will get so expanded and so loose and so wide, they lose their comprehension as a letter. Um, so the short answer is this limit, these edges we know so far are based on empirical experience there, but we don't know, we actually don't know what the theoretical limits are, but they definitely do exist. Thank you. You're welcome. I have another question. <laughs> what are the main challenges in designing a variable font? And what, are, uh, what would you say are the, the benefits, or yeah, the top five benefits uh, for us in doing digital design? Totally, totally. So I'll hit you with the, actually, you know, it's funny, as a type designer, my short answer is the difficulties will be the problems being a type designer. <laughs> so what I mean is it's just a lot of complexity to learn how to do the, draw the fonts. The, for those who are experienced in making fonts, it's, it's real production, it's relatively the same. There are some what's called mastering problems you have to solve, the font tables, basically. Have, there's, they're not as easy, clean tools that help do you for that, that help you do that, do that for you. You have to manually do it yourself a little bit to make it effective, uh, but it's not impossible. It's definitely not the worst. Your, your bigger hurdle will be just learning type design in general and how to use the workflow and draw fonts. Because I will say that is that the, probably the big distinction besides the mastering phase of fonts to in visual fonts is that the outline rendering is much fussier. 
So what I mean is, is that if you're, if you're sloppy with your drawing, it, it will pay, it, you will break your font, especially when curved transitions. It will cause very nasty transitions uh, when you move across your, your design space or between your variables you're drawing for. So it requires a kind of much more strict drawing in your Bezier handling to be effective. I will say that. I definitely have seen some variable fonts where like the S, the, the lowercase S, capital S is a quick, very easy identifier, how their spine is handled. Uh, if not rendered well, it will look very messy. It will be unstable in different ways, either too fat, too thin, you know, pinching in a weird way. Those are I've sense were the major issues. Uh, and sometimes you might need to draw in a very unusual, con unconventional way to make, the, make it work uh, in the interpolation process for our variable fonts. So that's the main challenge, I would say, from a drawing side versus in the mastering side. That does require some, some research and writing on blogs for that, checking the blogs and talking on type drawers, for example, to get that information, how to deal with it. Uh, but those are the two major notes in terms of challenges. Now, the opportunities, uh, I hinted at it roughly, the two major ones is the continuous nature of the variables. So what I mean is instead of these jerky jumps, the ability to have smooth transition between your extremes is your base is one of the number one attributes. Now, uh, the one example usually is weight or width. That's the usual ones, but it could be any variable. Anything you can actually move, you can, you can handle from one point A to point B, it basically helps with animation, unless I'm getting it. So anyone, I know a lot of some people are in motion, Basically, I see motion graphics people using variable fonts as a really strong potential because it's built for that. You could basically take those variable font attributes and apply motion to it. And it's built for that, basically, because it allows for continuous movement. Uh, and specifically, the, the documentation of what's called higher order interpolation by underwear is a promising direction of how to take that idea even further. Uh, the basic point is the interpolation effects are linear versus allowing a non-linear convex or concave transition. Uh, that's what higher order interpolation allows. So that allows even more interesting promise of what can motion do with type, for example. Um, I'll definitely shoot some links to talk about that idea. Uh, now, the other note besides continuous selection versus discrete is the idea of responsiveness to data. That's actually a really big one that I don't see many people exploring. There's some, I've seen some examples, for example, like light conditions, proximity to the screen, for example. Uh, any, any, because it's, it's now in CSS, like the attribute, and you could be tied as a continuous number and moved around like that. Any other data point using some JavaScript can basically impose into it uh, interaction. So there's the base of the world, the world's your oyster in terms of what that can mean. And basically it's any data interaction on the screen or the user input can affect type in a direct way, as opposed to uh, before the fact where the type designer or designer has to presuppose it. It can't be can decided on the screen at the moment, for example. Uh, motion tends to be the general direction I see people using this attribute for. So for example, you're, you're scrolling down the screen, the type might change from one state to another. That'd be like one very direct example. But what, Lexan's talking about is folk, uh, tying this to a metric of effectiveness in some way. So in this case, reading fluency, for example, preventing eye strain, things like that. Uh, you could use now these attributes could be attached to a data point. Let's say the luminosity of the screen. If what light's hitting the screen, the, the camera on the computer, for example, or on your phone, it picks out the luminosity data and then affects this type because of that, let alone the other attributes like color or contrast or size, for example. Uh, so that was kind of, I said kind of two things and I kind of broke them down to sub points. So I don't really have five per se. I do think those are probably the two, the major points. I could say file size, but that's kind of a secondary property in my opinion. Uh, that makes it more effective to use because the file size is lower versus just, you can't load your web page with too many fonts. Uh, that's prevented when you have variable fonts. Um, yeah, I think, that, I, think that, I think that answers your question the best I can right now. Yes, thank you. Welcome. I have a question, uh, Thomas. Um, you mentioned viewing distance, and I was actually going to ask something about it. Like, uh, yeah. is there any experimentation uh, related to viewports or, or viewing distance? Like, I mean, uh, displays that are at certain di uh, distance that 
obviously they have to have a, some sort of uh, uh, hardware to know where you are sitting or viewing uh, that screen. But also like if there's any experiments about uh, automatic responses, you also mentioned eye tracking. Is there any devices that can actually uh, understand if you have a prescription or know how you, depending on the pupils or something that you need more tracking, you need a bigger tie, bolder or, or contrast or anything like that? Mm -hmm. So the, on your answer of has people measured distance, the answer is yes. There's lots of, there's actually great. Nick Sherman had, has a whole website on this side, works with my other partners with it. Um, I'll look it up after this. I guess any links to give reference points to it. Um, there's definitely that. The guys interested, the persons like Andrew Johnson, interested in VR and type, have also explored this and use variable font technology to explore these points. So yes, absolutely. And by the way, those who are interested in spatial graphics, for example, in, in the sense of like environmental design, all that, this ties up that because basically font size and distance are, are directly related. So obviously, a font size that's this big, right? Like this gigantic, right? Will actually look like 10 point type. We'll have the reaction 10 point type when you're far enough back. So that's an absolutely valid point and a really interesting point. When you say, when you're asking your question uh, about can computers be aware of that distance? The answer is yes, VR technology will tell you that. Uh, there's definitely some documentation on that. So absolutely, there's definitely a lot of promising directions I see on that. Now the particulars of applying this to typography in these particular notes, that's an internal investigation in Lexan. We're definitely exploring that uh, and seeing those possibilities. We're definitely, and we're excited, we're looking forward to, to reporting on that soon at some point cool. in the future. Cool, thank you. Any other question, guys? I have, I have a main question, but it's more from my, my uh, typographic background and it's uh, do you did you consider the serif uh, font face instead of sans serif yeah that's a fascinating one so the work from bonnie we have to remember her context is that she's an educational therapist and we're dealing with struggling readers so i literally say i'm going to use the analogy of training wheels on a bike right we got to help these readers to get there and they're going to need as the assistance to get there you don't want to add complexity to them that's not going to give them a benefit. So the intervention, the literature basically says sans serif, low contrast. That's the basic mantra. Uh, now, I personally have a hypothesis. My personal interpretation is the, it's the spacing and the way, it's basically spacing is king. So basically, if we did another series of studies with serif fonts, the spacing would be the number one priority to affect. But note that I have to give a very clear context that there is a big difference between struggling readers and robust readers. So robust readers probably, there's no effect. There's no difference if you use serif versus sans serif. It's the spacing that's actually more important in contrast. There are the two more important properties. Because uh, as we know, there's sans serifs that are high contrast and there's serifs that are low contrast. So that's a more important attribute right there. And then there's spacing. Some are just spaced way too tight. Their headliner faces, that's not the right spacing setup for text setting let alone looser spacing, which is a bit more optimal for these cases. Uh, so the short answer is, there's probably a hierarchy of properties and it depends on who we're talking about. So we're talking about struggling readers, if that's our population we're worried about, 64% of readers in this case of students, then we gotta make it easy, we gotta like basically onboard them, right? Easily onboard them into the reading group, become a bus readers. So we need to eliminate any hindrances, and that would be high contrast and serifs in this case. Thank you. And, and, and another one, I, I think, do, do you think it's valuable for, um, I mean, the, the agency teams, like from the UX to Dev, dev uh, know about how variable fonts works? I mean, and, uh, and in which way it could help us uh, with the uh, digital projects? That's a great question. I mean, there's some, there's, this group asked some great questions. I think showed that it is possible. I think there's, I think the big part is how if you want type to respond to the user in a direct live event interaction, I think that should be. Pro I think the big conclusion you can walk away from this is that that is a consideration of your intervention or project. Then yes, variable fonts make perfect sense because they respond to data exactly. That like those attributes can be manipulated by 
in response of data of the computer uh, from from code basically in that case then yes that's the short answer i would say for who why when you should consider variable fonts is when that's the case and then it's, a, it's actually a very fun challenge you know again asking these questions how can weight size spacing all these attributes be responsive to the user in those particular contexts um, you know and you don't have to go super crazy with this kind of an individuation at this point they really could be very basic things like for example when you know uh you put things in dark mode that requires a different spacing relationship because of the halo effect that happens on type type when it's on a black background when it's white type on black it has it expands it actually has an expensive quality so you need to compensate with that with a reduction of weight and loosening of spacing that's usually how you would answer that question so that's a very subtle that's a very quick obviously if you're working on a, on dark modes to they have an intervention right there, just a simple one right there, let alone more advanced ones, like say you're doing things in environmental graphics or VR. I think those are other cases where variable fonts could be used or other cases when you, when you want to add delight to your visual experiences of your users and you want to tie user interaction with a tight change in type in some way in a continuous nature. So you don't want to jump very jauntily from one to the other. Cool, thank you. I don't know guys, if you have any other question for Thomas, I have a I have a comment. It's not so much a question, totally. but it's just that I find all that you did very interesting, and I related it. I am I don't have a very strong digital background. I actually come from print, mm -hmm. and I remember back in the days when I used professional fonts that would have um, optical sizes. Yes, you know what I mean. I did. And what you're talking about right here, it brings to me to be like the same but adapted to digital to the digital world so it it sounds very exciting awesome and congratulations thank you appreciate that um yeah that's, a, that's an excellent point now yeah optical size for those who don't mean i know uh who don't come from a print background context is the font basically changing based on its sizing and the basic attribute usually is, <laughs> usually is, do you have something to say about that? You have a reaction, like, oh no, so I want no, to Sorry, no, 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 I was, uh, yeah, it, it's something that is kind of mind blowing because of course, if the letter is going to be used very small, it has to have very specific characteristics for it in order to function. Whereas if it's title case, it, it's big, of course, the kerning can be, uh, you know, lowered so much. So mm -hmm. yes. that's the optical sizes. Exactly. Because remember, one, this was kind of a consequence of, of the method. Everything was done by hand at one point. So what happened was uh, each one had been made by hand and they made local adjustments because of that. So you had type that's very, when it was large, it was usually higher contrast and tighter spaced. Those are usually the attributes we would normally see. And when it got smaller, they got lower in contrast, features got more definite, much more exaggerated, and spacing got looser. Uh, so because they're all done by hand, that's what happened. Uh, that started to change when the pantogram got invented. So what happened was uh, they would have basically one drawing, and they would have this copy machine, basically. It was like this little, basically, lever, lever system. You would draw on a trace in a very large outline drawing of a letter, and then it, this pentagram would take that drawing and do you make it a super, super tiny. So the same drawing is being used for the very large size and very small size. That precurses what we have digitally now. So this is the suggestion that we're kind of returning back to an optical size revolution in digital type. That is absolutely accurate. Uh, that is definitely what's happening here. Um, there is a little bit of not just education, but justification has to come in in terms of you, people need to know how to call up these attributes in their code and know when to use them and when it's justifiable to use them. Uh, so there is that challenge because before one was all when the type was preset this way, you got 72 point, there it is. Like the size and the optical adjustments came one to one. Apple recently in their current edition of their San Francisco font did do that. They actually have in their applications an automatic detector to change the optical settings at the size. So there's already some investigation to try to reintroduce this, inter this interaction of font size and optical size together at the same time. So they don't, it doesn't have to be testified in code anymore. So that I, this, is, this is a great suggestion. We are, we're trying to turn, return back to what we lost in digital typography from the old print tradition. 
Cool. Do you have any documentation about uh, the the using of uh, that in kind of interaction, like uh, changing the size depending of the user of the distance of uh, of the yes. screen, I that you could share with us? <laughs> that would I be know. very interesting. Yeah, totally. Uh, let me see if I can do it up right now. And also, we would love to see um, any examples of uh, digital projects using variable fonts or your fonts, just to see how it works live. There are some samples to see how it gets used, like in, on the preview site. So on the lesson.com, you can see. Uh, how this could affect and how this could work. So you could use that. Uh, we now, what's into, what is exciting is that a lot of platforms have started to use, and adopt Lexin and allow their users to use it. We haven't really grabbed yet examples of educators and other people using Lexin in font applications. I mean, that's probably why I'm excited to talk to everybody here. So if you guys ever find an opportunity to use Lexin, I mean, I would be very honored for you to do so. And I would love, we would love to have that reference just to see how you guys are using the typography and using these attributes. Uh, in the meantime, I did find size calculator. That's the site. Uh, it basically very quickly demonstrates the idea that viewing distance, physical size and perceived size are linearly related. Basically you change two, the third goes with it. So that'd be one example right there. And then, uh, in a second, I'm gonna pull up Andrew Johnson. He's done some great work in VR and type and with variable fonts as well. So he's also in my mind. Okay. You know, and by the way, I mean, these concepts uh, are, are an extension and building out from the literature on what's called flexible typography, for example, from da, da, da. Yeah, I can pull that up. It basically thinks of typography as a system as opposed to uh, not just a static, uh, direct one form only. Tim Brown, the member, he's at Adobe. He's we were in the book on it. I'm trying to pull that up here. Actually, we have an interview with Type Thursday with him, so I'm going to pull that up now. I'll give you guys that link. And then let's see. And then let's see. Now, actually, on one, I will say one personal note of experience, actually, on the promotion site for Lexan, working with Michael Rich, who, who made the site, who worked on the, make the site, presentation site for Lexan. Now, there is a really interesting attribute of Lexan outside the educational intervention context that might be relevant, relevant for everyone here. Uh, for those who may come from, from the print background, you, I, you may recall the advice of, if you got a set type really small, track it out, basically, that kind of reference point. Uh, even doubly so if you if you're not if it's white type on black on color background if it's on a knockout experience uh, type setting, uh, we found that actually that that's a very solid point of Lexan and actually gets more effective when you use like the more extreme intervention modes like for example our naming system is by degree of amplification. Uh, you let's say you set your header your body copy at deca or like you know let's say like sixteen point deca, and then when you go down to a smaller size like eight point going to EXA as a static font or, or basically applying the, the variable font attribute of moving it up a little bit, maybe adding like 20 units of it. Uh, that slight increase of spacing of the hyper expansion, right? That ex, ex, adding with adding white space between and inside the letter forms makes it much more readable and just a normal experience, let alone you're not a struggling reader. Uh, that's just, again, just a probably just practical advice point. I just noticed from people using Lexan in, in, in practical experience. Uh, it works very well. And, you know, besides the more extreme interventions that are meant for very extreme uh, needs, the, the variable font smoothness and jump in, in, in transitions allows for that kind of subtlety of typography to help as you get smaller in size to maintain typographic readability. Uh, I think that's a very important answer, that just detail note I can share with you guys. Thank you. Awesome. I think I think if I'm not if there is no more questions, if I'm gonna do the most obvious one because I'm pretty sure that some of them don't know what it's a variable font on and how it works. So it would be nice if you could just right, well, several points. So the variable font is uh, 
instead of basically, let's put it this way, right? You have Garamond regular, Garamond bold, Garamond italic, Garamond italic bold. Uh, instead of being discrete fonts, they're all pff, compressed together into one file. That'd be the one on the production note what it is. So instead of getting multiple files, you get one file. Uh, now, beyond that technical point, just that basic point, then you just have what I just said, which was discrete versus continuous and responsiveness to data versus non-responsive to data. Uh, those were, I think, the major distinctions between variable fonts and traditional fonts. Cool, thank you. Uh, so I don't know if, 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 you, if any of you have another question for Thomas. If not, I think we're done. I can ask another one. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Sure. Oh, you good. Are you currently working on another product of a variable font? I'm sorry. I was you're asking. Break, you're breaking up. Okay, sorry. I was asking if maybe you were working in a new project different to Lexend um, of another variable font that has more of a commercial use. Yeah, great point. Well, uh, hmm. well, to be frank, I'm working on, I, I, I do have fonts I'm working on. And actually on a personal note, it's something I've had, I've had interest in was applying basically let, get the, basically the, the same form, the same intervention mode, right? To a serif font. I've been meditating on that point uh, personally. So that's probably, I mean, that's not gonna be for years from now, to be honest, how, you know, how my life goes. I work on a lot of projects. Uh, as if I wasn't busy with Type Thursday and Lexin, like we have a lot of work to do on that. Uh, I also am a co I'm a co-chair in Type Week in Type Weekend, a conference that's online that's happening in, in September. Uh, and I teach, so I have a lot going on in a lot of different directions, uh, I would say. Also, I have non, like besides, besides this kind of fonts, I do, yeah, I basically do, I basically plan all my fonts I do produce commercially going forward to be variable fonts. So it's just basically my terms of my protocol and production, it's basically the way I'm gonna move forward. So, because basically from a raw, from a raw production point of view, there's really no distinction because I, I'm making the fonts exactly the same way, variable font or static, it's just what's the output in the end. And that's not much of a difference. So the short answer is all my fonts, I do retail wise going forward will be variable fonts going forward. Cool, sounds good. I don't know, Thomas, if you want to just give us uh, last advice, uh, mainly thinking about the importance of typography and and in the digital environments and also in the prints and stuff and the, the way that we use it as a designers. Totally. Well, like I said, and the big note is one that maybe, first of all, I hope everyone just kind of realized that, you know, don't take, for, don't take reading for granted. Maybe you can read very well, but that's not the case for the majority of people, uh, of your users, most likely. So if that is the case, then basically treat this like an issue, a question of accessibility, like anything else you want. Like if you just the same intentionality you have on dark mode, for example, or other questions of accessibility, this should be in the same category, in my opinion. Uh, you have the capacity to do so, it's relatively low cost, it's available to be used, and it's possible to use that. Now, just beyond accessibility questions, is exploration. There's lots of, it's a whole wide world, west, it's a wild west potential for variable fonts. And I hope, my hope is at the end of this talk, you see some potentials. And you, I already see that people are asking questions, they're inquiring, they're getting curious. And that's already a great sign I'm seeing of what I was hoping the outcome would be from this talk is that you're inspired, you're curious, and you're in a state of wonder about what's possible on the interaction of typography, users, and code. That's the basic note I would say. Uh, if that was achieved and you incur that further, I did my job in this talk. Uh, and I think that's great. So obviously my, Email is always open. I love these kind of investigations and meditating on this. And if there's an opportunity to explore how Lexin can help with reading performance in your in any of your case examples or projects, I know Lexin will be very happy to contribute and collaborate. 